I'll share. Right. I will share my screen. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining into our webinar today. I'm Dhruv Singhal, the founder of Open Gears, as well as a junior here at Matee Valley High School. And it's great to see that you are interested in listening to the speaker today. Once again, I hope that you take advantage of this event to learn more about a rising and exciting field in biomedical engineering and material science. You know, figuring out what I wanted to do was a struggle. It was a challenge for me. So I also encourage you to check out our library of recorded webinars on YouTube to gain a unique insight into the other careers out there in STEM. The link to the YouTube channel is on our website, theopengears.com. Now I would like to welcome our speaker today, Jayraj Narendran. Jayraj is a first year PhD student in material science and engineering at Boston University. And he received his bachelor's degree in bioengineering with a minor in material science and engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where he researched nanoparticles, tissue engineering, and soft materials. Before we start the webinar, I want to remind again that please, please do not hesitate to ask questions throughout the course of the webinar, whether you decide to unmute or write them in the chat. Thank you so much, Jayraj, for taking time out of your busy schedule to help inspire students to pursue your STEM career. And without further ado, please give him your undivided attention and a warm virtual round of applause. Thank you, Jayraj. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, also, first and foremost, thank you so much for this opportunity. I think you're doing a great job here um, trying to inspire and teach um, students about all the opportunities out there. So I really appreciate this opportunity for myself as well. All right, so my presentation will be on biomedical engineering. So here is my presentation. Um, so a little, a little bit about me. Um, I went to Nico Valley High School um, and I was class of 2017. I'm from Naperville, Illinois. Um, and then I did my undergrad at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, um, where I majored in bioengineering and I had a minor in material science and engineering. And I was a class of 2021 there. Um, right now, I am a first year PhD student at Boston University um, in the material science and engineering program. And I'm expected class of 2026. Some of my hobbies include badminton, basketball, cooking, video games, and writing. Um, and so before I dive in, um, I wanna remind you guys again, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to chime in um, and I'll be more than happy to explain further. So a little bit of a topics outline here is I'm going to go over what is biomedical engineering, um, just some of my experiences going through this, and finally some tips and how to learn more. So first and foremost, what is biomedical engineering? Um, oftentimes I will use the term um, biomedical engineering, but I might also use bioengineering or BME. Um, these all mean the same thing. They're just people refer to them in different words. So the definition of biomedical engineering is the application of engineering principles and techniques to problems in medicine and biology as the design and production of artificial limbs and organs. And this is dictionary.com's definition right here. So the importance of this is that it allows people to create innovative solutions to worldwide health problems to make diagnoses and treatments both cheaper and more effective. So here's some of the famous BME um, inventions that you've probably heard about. Um, prosthetics and orth orth orthotics have been around for millennia, but essentially what the idea is that they um, replace a missing or, or weakened body part um, and he was trying to essentially make it stronger um, so they can, so the person could be more uh, functional. Um, examples, you've always, you've probably seen like foot prostheses where if they don't have like um, below knee, they might be missing a limb. Um, they might have like prostheses like as shown here. Um, another famous BME invention you've probably heard of are antibiotics and insulin. Um, these were both developed in the 1920s and they essentially set a new precedent of disease treatment um, by using specific drugs to target the disease um, very specifically. 
um, X-rays, CT scans, MRIs were developed in the 1970s, and these are instruments that allowed the medical imaging of the body. And finally, CRISPR-Cas9 is something that people have uh, heard about much in the past decade, and that as well as cell therapies are more recent innovations that involve altering existing cells to serve a specific function. Do biomedical engineers also work on the um, manufacturing of vaccines like the COVID vaccine? Yeah, um, the pharmaceutical industry often looks for um, a lot of different uh, people with different backgrounds. Um, bioengineers are a great example of people that are like perfect for the job with their experiences in chemistries and biology. Um, so yeah, vaccine, again, vaccines are another huge thing that biomedical engineers have played a part in developing. That's cool. So some of the BME tracks, and this is based off of the tracks from UIUC. Um, different colleges will have different ways they want to cluster groups or um, like certain research concentrations. And so these tracks are specific to UIUC, but um, they can vary depending on which college you go to. Um, and I kind of line these with the in inventions from before. So biomechanics is more of a mechanical engineering focus, and you're studying the physical properties of the body and developing solutions for deficiencies. Um, generally, you would think of like processes um, or like bone implants, but it can also be more small scale, um, like working with how um, cells interact with each other and their physical properties when they interact with each other. That's also considered biomechanics as well. So computational and imaging, I kind of cluster or group this these two into one. Um, generally, computational biomedical engineering and imaging and sensing are two different tracks. Um, but for the purposes of grouping them together, it makes sense to group them here. And this is more like computer science and like electrical slash computer engineering focus. <clears throat> and the idea is um, for computational bioengineering, what you're doing is you're going to be creating models for diagnoses of different diseases. Um, or for the imaging and sensing, you might be making new techniques for imaging certain parts of the body. Therapeutics is more of like a math C's material science and engineering focus. Um, this was my um, concentration in my undergrad. The idea here is finding strategies for drug delivery or implantable materials. Um, it's only been very recently that we've been trying to focus our drug delivery to certain parts of the body. Um, earlier, it was kind of just you take a pill and it would essentially um, get absorbed by your intestinal tract. Uh, and then the drug will essentially, some of it might um, go and help you with your illness, but a lot of it will just go, um, just go down through your um, general like urine or poop. So a lot of the drug would be wasted. Um, but the idea here is finding specific, specific drug delivery where if you have a disease, um, like let's say it's cancer, um, it, will, it will essentially emit like a signal um, out into the body, and you can harness these signals to essentially make drugs that localize this area and be able to um, target that specific area and be effective, be an effective treatment. Um, so that's kind of what the idea of what therapeutics is. And cell and tissue engineering is somewhat similar. Um, the idea is with therapeutics, it's more of like you're creating a solution outside of the body and you're putting it into the body, while cell and tissue engineering is more so of um, you're taking cells or like a genome that you already have um, and you're using such things such as like CRISPR-Cas9 or different, different um, tissue engineering techniques to take these cells, um, change them a little bit and put them back into the body to able to treat disease or have a new functionality. Uh, example of this is CAR T cells, um, which are chimeric antigen receiving um, T cells. And what these do are essentially you take cells from the body, you give it certain antigens, allow it to specifically um, target cancer cells, and then you put it back into the body. And now they're like, like prime to prime to target, target cancer cells and be more effective treatment for cancers. So I'm assuming in that track, you do a lot of research with stem cells, right? Yeah. Yeah. Stem cells, again, stem cells are pretty big um, for CAR T cells specifically. Um, are pretty big, uh, pretty big technique to use here. Um, right. They can be used for a lot of different things, um, depending on the idea of stem cells, because you can change them into different types of cells 
um, because they're kind of like the base cell that all of the cells come from. Um, they can be essentially programmed to do a lot of different things. Uh, so they're very effective and pretty a lot of research going into um, that topic. So your typical college classes when you're a biomedical engineer, um, you'll take your mathematics courses, which are your general calculus, your differential equations, linear algebra, computer science. Um, that usually you'll take your first couple of years. Um, also a lot of science classes because biomedical engineering is more broad than other, other um, engineering disciplines. You'll take biology, chemistry, and physics um, and different like different advanced levels of each. Um, like at more advanced levels of biology and chemistry are necessary as a biomedical engineer. And then you'll take probably like the introductory physics. Um, one really cool thing about engineering, um, engineering disciplines, not just biomedical engineering, is that you'll take a lot of labs uh, and project-based classes, um, which you might not take as like a biology or other um, sciences. And the idea is you'll take classes, at least for biomedical engineers, you take like circuits and instrumentation classes, to learn a lot about um, op amps or resistors and how to use them, um, which is again very important if you're going on to work with like medical devices and such. Um, we learn have like physiology labs where you learn how different uh, medical instruments work, like EMGs or EKGs. And every engineering deci deci discipline also has a senior capstone project where you're trying to um, solve a problem or um, so essentially you'll have like a semester or two semesters um, to solve like a problem that's given to you um, using like the skills that you've acquired throughout your, um, throughout your four years. And finally, you'll take track electives, which are more advanced classes related to your specific track courses. So I saw that we have a question um, in the chat. Uh, is AP Bio necessary in high school? Um, I actually did not take AP Bio in high school, so you don't necessarily need to take AP Bio, um, but taking AP courses, and I'll explain this a bit more in detail later, um, taking AP courses, especially in the sciences that you want to do later, can be useful. Um, I didn't take AP Bio. Um, I had friends that did take AP Bio, and we both did fine in the college class, but having that kind of baseline is always helpful, um, regardless of what you're planning on doing in the future. Also, like, how many electives did you take within your track? Um, generally, we take, uh, for biomedical engineers, it's six. Um, I took a few more because I wanted to finish a minor in material science. Oh, right. um, so I took a few more than six uh, track electives. And now I'm actually going to show you the classes that I, some of the classes I took. Um, so here's the UIUC curriculum map. Um, this is specifically for the therapeutics track. Um, so if I can show you have your attention right here you can see the first two years it's like a lot of like calculus one I, so like calculus one and two i had taken in undergrad or in high school through like calc bc um so that was already taken care of but you're taking like general chemistry general chemistry lab um if you took ap chem you you would have been able to skip these i also did not take ap chem um you have your calculus two your like introductory physics like mechanics and enm same ap physics class you took in high school um, MCB would be like your kind of like AP bio equivalent, but they do go into more depth, more depth than they do in high school. Um, biomedical data analysis. This is, uh, this course wasn't around when I, when I had it, this actually curriculum map is from this year. Um, when I took it, we just had like a, um, any like computer science credit. Um, so I took AP computer science in high school that counted for my, um, biomedical data analysis credit essentially. And you can see these chem, chem labs as well. Um, second year, you're doing, again, some more introductory classes. You're taking a few more advanced, um, in, in like more advanced biology classes, organic chemistry, um, linear algebra. Third year, you're trying starting to take some more track electives, um, as well as more advanced classes as well, tissue engineering, uh, modeling human physiology, um, again, these are the quantitative physiology lab and then the instrumentation class. And by the fourth year, you're basically taking all track electives and as well as your senior, senior design, like capstone project, essentially. Um, some of the track electives that I've take, taken were cancer nanotechnology, immunoengineering, soft robotics, engineering materials, 
thermodynamics. So thermodynamics, polymer science, um, these are more for my minor. Um, so that they were taken through the material science department. Um, but then synthesis of materials, design and use of biomaterials. Um, so there's a lot of different track um, possibilities. Um, and you don't necessarily have to stay within your track to take some of these courses. If you're interested in, um, if you're interested in, for example, how MRIs work, you might take like a class, specific class on imaging and sensing. Um, so that's also possible as well. Uh, oh, I saw another question. Um, did you do AP chemistry and physics? I took AP, chem uh, AP physics um, in my high school. Uh, I didn't take AP chemistry. Um, so it ended up working out at the end. Uh, I was able to do chem, physics, and bio as well in, in college. Um, so, I mean, it works out. It'll, it'll save you maybe like one semester, uh, one class. Um, so it's good to always, great to take AP classes. Um, what was your favorite class that you took in college? In college, my favorite class was, um, there were two classes that I really liked. Um, they were immunoengineering and soft robotics. Uh -huh. um, so immunoengineering is like learning how, um, essentially how diseases work and how to, um, how to essentially engineer certain, um, like your antigens and such to, to like combat disease. And actually a really cool thing about this was I was taking this right as the pandemic began. Um, so our professor had given us the optional final project of creating a COVID vaccine. So we actually looked at the research that we'd already done that was already done on coronaviruses in the past um, because coronaviruses have been along for a while. Um, this was just another variant of it. Um, so we'd done, we looked at research into coronaviruses and we actually created, essentially created like a COVID vaccine using like past research. Um, and the professor loved it. Um, but yeah, that was a really cool class I took. Soft robotics was another class um, that I took my senior year. And this one was essentially, our professor was really hands-on. Um, so she loved creating like projects that we could make ourselves. So we took silicone gels and we would make like hand actuators or we would make uh, or, like finger actuators or like, pre like pressure sensors using like heat seal material or like or magnetic material, magnetic fabric. Um, like a hand cast out of like heat seal materials um, and like a pressure pump. Um, so a lot of like cool projects, like small projects that kind of taught you basic principles in soft robotics. And um, what was also kind of fun to do as well. Wow. And I'm assuming the senior design was like the capstone, right? Yeah, yeah. Senior design was um, was more it's like the capstone project um so we for that we were paired up with a um with like a company or like a research group somewhere on campus and we would essentially engineer a solution with them and we like um i'll explain this more so later um we'll go into more detail about that um now right. i saw another question how did you develop your interest uh, for biomedical engineering um, I will actually have a slide on this as well. So I will explain that later as well. So post-college opportunities for biomedical engineers, there's three main places that biomedical engineers go after their undergrad. Um, one is academia, another is industry, and another is medical school. Um, and I'll explain uh, each of those as well. Uh, another question about uh, what I want to do. And I will also explain to that, <laughs> explain that later. Um, like they're reading your mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, slowly. I'll get to the, everything slowly. Academia, this is what I'm doing right now. Um, academia generally is referring to research. Um, you usually do research with like a um, university. Um, but there's different levels to it as well. Uh, master's programs may not be considered actual academia. Uh, but essentially, you're just doing classes it's like one to two years. You're taking classes, more advanced classes in your field of choice. And you have the option to do a thesis, which is kind of like a project where you defend like, right, like a 30 page paper on it and you like defend it against a committee. Um, so that's like that option, that research part is optional. So not everyone has to do this. PhD is what I'm doing right now. 
Um, you can go to a PhD straight out of undergrad, or you can do a master's and then go to a PhD. Uh, the big difference is that if you do a master's and then go to a PhD, you don't have to take the classes because you've already taken those classes. Uh, if you're going to a PhD straight out of undergrad, you'll have to take those two, like one, two years of classes first. Um, so I came straight out of an undergrad. So I, this, this first year I'm taking classes. Um, and then after that, you take mandatory research under a professor. Um, and then you work with that professor, pick a topic of, that you like, and that professor um, that professor specializes in, and you will research that for like four years after your qualifying exams first year. Um, and a note on PhDs I'll explain is that um, one of the biggest things about a PhD is that it's important to find something that you want to do, like something that you enjoy. But a PhD, you'll oftentimes, the biggest thing you get out of it is the skills you develop. Um, you learn a lot about um, like a lot of critical thinking skills, a lot of looking at a problem, um, trying to approach it in different ways, um, just like and a lot of perseverance and determination. So it teaches you a lot of skills which aren't, are more soft skills that you wouldn't expect. Um, and essentially, uh, I've I, a good good way of describing it is I, I say a PhD is where you're, where you learn how to learn. Uh, essentially, you're just like finding out how to best learn a completely new topic. And you'll often see in industry that people take do a PhD in one thing and then they'll go do something completely different, which might seem kind of crazy. But because PhD teaches you how to learn, like pretty much anything, or like find learn something new and like problem solve in ways that you wouldn't be used to as just like a regular undergrad. Um, it's a really useful skill to have regardless of where you go after a PhD. Um, after a PhD, um, a postdoc is another thing that people may do after a PhD. Um, and the years of this can be variable, can change uh, depending on your project. Um, this may be like two to three years, four to six years. It, depends on the specific, um, what's specifically going on here. And essentially this is more of an independent research where you work with a faculty, but you're kind of like managing projects more so than you did as like a PhD student. Professorship is uh, another thing that you do after like a postdoc. Uh, this year you'll be like your general, like university professor, you may teach classes, um, you manage your research, manage research like as a research lab, and you might be like a principal investigator where you manage other PhD students and undergrads. Um, you'll have college advising responsibilities as well, um, but that's what professorship is. And a key thing to note is that you can go to industry after any step. A lot of people do their masters, then go to industry. A lot of people would do a PhD and go to industry. Some people go do their postdocs and go to industry. Some people go become full-fledged professors um do research and then one of their one of their like innovations that they find during their research they might want to spin that into a startup company and then they go into industry after that so like academia is not like a set in stone thing you can always like dip your toes in do what you need to do and then go back to industry and um it's pretty like fluid in that in that sense and also the other way around some people do work for a few years and then they come to academia as well so was the research aspect of um, pursuing a PhD a big factor as to why you chose to skip the masters? Yeah, um, I, 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 I liked, enjoyed the research that I did as an undergrad mm -hmm. and I wanted, and I knew I'd, I'd enjoy it going forward. So that's why I wanted to like skip a masters and go straight to a PhD as well. Mm -hmm. um, to clarify, you said that the, um, the classes that you take as a PhD student, you'd also take the same classes as a master's student, right? Yeah. So right now, um, right now the classes I'm taking are actually the same as the master's students in material science. Um, so like I have master's students in my classes. And so we're taking like the same set of core classes and then we'll take like same set of like concentration courses as well. Um, so so yeah, if, so because because I didn't do a master's, I'm taking those master's classes right now. Um, but like I have a friend of mine who did a master's first and then came to do his PhD. Um, and generally, if you do a master's in the US and then you're doing a PhD in the US um, in like the same discipline, generally you wouldn't 
need to take courses at the PhD school. Um, so he's not taking courses because he already took his courses at his previous college as a master's student. Um, so that's how that works. Okay. I see another question about extracurriculars and I will explain that later as well. <laughs> So industry, um, generally industry refers to company-backed research for product development. Um, examples would be medical devices, medicines, therapies. Uh, I know Dhruv mentioned um, the vaccine. That's another great example. Pfizer um, is another example of a company that would hire biomedical engineers um, to like make vaccines. And they also make other therapies as well. Um, another thing, uh, uh, industry can also, I guess it's not necessarily industry, but like uh, company or research can also be like government backed. If you're working for like the NIH, um, you're, re you're funded by the government and it's like a government project. Um, and then post undergrad degrees are very useful for higher positions and more pay. Um, a lot of people will, like I mentioned before, do their undergrad, go to industry, work for a few years, realize they want like a higher position. Um, so they'll go back to um, do a master's or PhD and then go back to industry and then yeah, like a higher position as well. Um, so again, you can switch back and forth um, pretty seamlessly and as much as you need for your jobs. Um, uh, I saw a question here that I've heard some colleges don't recommend using the credit from AP Science class to skip the courses in college. Is biomedical engineering a field where you should take advantage of AP classes? Um, this is actually a good question um, because it really depends on the courses. Um, I would say also depends on what engineering you're doing. For biomedical engineering, um, biology and chemistry are at the core of the, of the major. And so skipping the introductory um, chemistry has been done. Um, I saw my friends had done it because they took AP chemistry. Um, and that was, was fine at our college, not necessarily at all colleges. Um, but they, they, they said, don't skip introductory biology. Um, and my friend who had taken an AP, bio, had taken AP biology and got a good score on it, um, he could have skipped it and he, he decided not to skip it because um, the course and in college is more in depth and it's important to have a good foundation. But you can, you can definitely take AP, at least for, bio, for my program, um, take AP physics to get, to get over the um, E&M and mechanics requirement. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty common. Um, so I, I guess it depends really on what major you're looking for, looking at and also at um, that at reputation of the course because physics might be more generalized for biomedical engineering, but like biology is gonna be very important that you know really well um, all, the, all, the, um, all the information. Um, so that might all, that might be a little bit like um, like maybe that's why they recommend not to skip it. Um, for other classes, such as like if you've taken like history classes or economics classes, that stuff like definitely use that. Um, I took a lot of like AP Micro, AP Macro, um, European history, U.S. history, um, statistics, and all that stuff counted towards like my general education requirements, which is really useful. Um, so I didn't have to take a bunch of like bunch of like general education or gen eds essentially in college and I could focus more on technical courses and electives. A great answer, J Raj. Yeah. Yes. If I could add to that too, you know, um, you know, even my teacher just says like, you know, the high school AP classes are like meant to, you know, introduce you to the field. And then, you know, in college that like they might have the same exact course structure, but they just go in depth a little bit more. So, you know, again, it's just up to you. And typically, you know, people do settle for that like in-depth explanation of that field that you will get in college, which is why people don't use the AP credit. But you know, again, it varies, like Jay Raj said. Yeah, it varies a lot. Um, but it's definitely always great to talk to older people in the program. Um, if you know someone who's already been through the biomedical engineering program or mechanical engineering program or whatever you're pursuing, um, always useful to talk to them and see what they say. Um, like for for example, our um, our biomedical engineering program when I joined was a really small cohort. Um, we had like thirty students in our year, um, and oftentimes because the program was so small, 
some of the best advice you could get is from older students. So we would ask our third years or fourth years, hey, what course did you take? Which course do you, should you take with this course? Should I take that course with this course? What like course should I not take? Um, so like talking to older people um, that have gone through the same place that you go, wanna go through, it's always a great idea to get that information you want. Um, so another possibility is medical school. Um, here I include like MDs or DOs and, or any other medicine related programs. Um, and essentially different programs have different steps. Um, and, but the end goal is in some capacity to be in the medical field as a practicing generalist or specialist. Um, and the reason why biomedical engineers are often, um, often go to medical school, or I guess perhaps to put it in another way, why medical schools like biomedical engineers is because um, biomedical engineers are often better critical thinkers and can be better prepared for the breakers of medical school. Um, because they're trained as an engineer, um, they look at problems in a different light and they're basically trying to find a solution. And this just like, it's a quality that's harder to teach and can be really useful. Um, like as a, as, as a physician or any other practicing uh, professional in the, med in the medical field. Um, but yeah, one of the biggest things is that they can better prepare you for the rigors of medical school. Um, I have a couple of friends. Um, one of them um, had done biomedical engineering at U of I. Another one of them had done uh, biology somewhere else. And um, like definitely the biomedical engineering program is a lot harder when you do it as an undergrad uh, than like a biology program. But when they went to med school, it's like another level. And so the biomedical engineer is ready um, like he was like, he hit the ground running. He had like, obviously it's tough, but he kind of like had an idea of how to manage his time and stuff. While the biology major, it was a little bit tougher for him. And I mean, he's fine now, but it was like initially a little tougher. Um, so it's, it really depends whether, I'm not an expert in pre-med stuff, but um, I would say you can definitely go both ways. You can go as a biomedical engineer if you want to do pre-med, if you can go as a biology major or like psych major or such as a pre-med, both will get you where you want to be. Um, with biomedical engineering, you may have less time for other extracurriculars and it'll be more rigorous at that time. While if you're doing biology, you may need to do more research or um, do like more extracurriculars and such to be like equally competitive. So it's like, it's like a trade-off between both um, and they're both successful. It's just basically how you want to approach that. So now I'll talk about my experiences. Um, so in high school, um, I took a lot of APs and honors courses, um, a lot of courses in science, math, history courses. And essentially, like Drew mentioned, there gives you like a good like glimpse of undergrad courses are like. Uh, they may not go as in depth, but they will and it's just introduce you to it and it's also give you somewhat of an idea of how tough it may be. Um, courses in, in undergrad are semester-based. So essentially what you would learn in like a regular year as um, in high school is kind of like condensed to a semester. So AP courses are probably the best way to prepare you for the rigors of like undergrad courses. And honestly, even if you don't take courses specific to whatever your, your um, whatever you're um, doing in undergrad, it's still pretty useful. Um, like I took AP European history and AP um, US history, which is like nothing related to what I like what I'm doing now or what I did in undergrad. However, it did, it was a lot of work and it definitely teaches you a lot of like time management, um, how to like synthesize information. So like a very like reading heavy courses um, teaches you how to synthesize information. Um, so it's regardless of what you take, whatever APs you take, you're going to get something out of it, honestly. Um, so as schedule permitting, take as many as that you are comfortable with um, and it'll pay off. Even if you're, if, if you're not doing that in on your undergrad, that credit, yeah, AP credit, if you get a good score, um, will definitely help you out skip maybe some classes here and there um uh some of the clubs that i did were deca and science olympiad 
Um, DECA, if you're not familiar with, is like a business club um, where essentially they have competitions, uh, kind of like case competitions where you like, they'll give you a problem and you need to like on the spot try to find a solution for it. Um, so DECA did a really good job teaching me how to present myself in a professional setting, um, kind of like how to dress, how to talk to business professionals, um, kind of like those interpersonal skills, which are really important regardless of what you do um, after high school or college. Um, I also did Science Olympiad, which allowed me to explore my interest in science. Um, I did like my, the, the events I did weren't really biology related at all, um, but they were still kind of cool ways to like explore some of the interesting things that are in the science. Um, I did cross country um, for three years in high school and it was a good way to relax. And, but it also teaches the importance of discipline and hard work. So any, any sport or um, activity teaches you that like if you put in the work and like think about the strategies and techniques that will pay dividends in their mentality approaching other subjects or topics as well. Finally, another thing I was really involved in was volunteering. Um, it's a very fulfilling experience in general. I just love helping out other people, um, but also you meet a lot of different people and you get a really, really different perspective on um, just like different people and like different problems. And you also you just don't know who you'll meet and how they might you know, help you out in the future. Out of curiosity, which DECA events did you do? I did... Um, I did advertising campaign. Um, I did DECA for my junior and senior years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was literally, I wasn't even really interested in it. One of my friends was just like, hey, you should do DECA because I'm doing DECA and like, oh. I think it'd be cool. And I'm like, ah, sure, screw it. I'll do it. And um, I actually ended up going to um, like the nationals too, uh, my junior year. Wow. Uh, it's really cool. I went to Nashville for like a, like a six day, like five, six day event. And there's like people from like all over the world literally coming for this competition. I was like, I didn't even expect me to be here. Like I barely knew what this club was last year, but um, what about for, like, science what events si for science Olympiad, I did, uh, I did wind power. Uh -huh. um, and I did wind power the whole time that it was like an event for my, my sophomore to senior year. I did science Olympiad all four, four years of um, not all four years, I guess. I moved halfway through freshman year, but three mm -hmm. years of high school. Mm -hmm. And for that, I did wind power. I did um, compound machines when it was an event. Um, I did, what else did I do? Oh, There's like one for hovercraft. I did that one, like for just randomly as a senior. Mm -hmm. And then I also did one more. Um, what was it? I think it was called Dynamic Planet. I'm not sure. Um, so like, it was like random, like mechanical engineering, geology, stuff like, just like completely random, but I was like, hey, it's interesting. So might as well try that out. Volunteering stuff was kind of less like, um, I didn't do any specific volunteering. Um, like I know a lot of people do like Edward Hospital volunteering and stuff. Um, um, I didn't do any specific ones. I kind of just found whatever I could and I did those. I did stuff like, um, we did stuff like food drives or like launching at um, teaching Girl Scouts how like code, like computer classes and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, just like random stuff around the community. And I feel like if you can just find random stuff to do in the community, uh, what else did I do? Uh, I, I like volunteered at the library. Um, it's just like completely random stuff, but you, it's always, a, you meet a lot of cool people. So, I mean, it's always yeah. great to try it out. That's a great way to get back to the community. Yeah. Um, so addressing an earlier question, why did I choose biomedical engineering? Um, I wanted to create solutions to existing medical problems and enhance the lives of others. Um, uh, like I mentioned in this last slide, I love helping out people. And I wanted to do something where I can know that what I'm doing or making um, can help out people um, in like indirectly or directly. And also I loved math and science growing up. Um, just love tinkering with stuff, taking things apart, putting them back together. Um, and I thought engineering is a great place to both explore that and kind of put that to use. So that's why I, the, combining those two um, things is why I chose biomedical engineering. Uh, I also love just health in general, um, whether it be like working out and just understanding how that affects the body or just like how injuries recover over time. 
uh, I've always been interested. Um, whenever someone, like whenever we're like hanging out and someone gets hurt, I'm always like the person who's like, oh, how did that happen? Like, what can we like, how can you like get better and stuff? So it's just like kind of just combining all those interests. And, and that's why I decided to go into biomedical engineering. So then why did I choose UIUC? Um, so UIUC has a long history of established research and um, industry. Uh, just people, successful professors and entrepreneurs went there. Um, the co-founder of YouTube lived in the same dorm down the hall from me, well, obviously like 20 years before, but regardless, he lived like, like essentially his, his, his dorm room has like a plaque, like the co-founder of YouTube lived here. Um, but like the inventor of the LED went to U of I back, um, back in the 60s, he was like a person, uh, faculty here. A um, lot of cool inventions, a lot of a lot of people in um, a lot of people who made great inventions and innovations um, went to U of I. So they have a long history of of just successful people and alumni. They also have great resources and opportunities um, and state of the art facilities. Um, just when I was there, there was so much construction going on because they were building like new facilities. Um, they recently had made this this very nice um, electrical engineering building where it had a bunch of labs and classes and it was like um, it had a lot it got a lot of its power from like solar panels on top of the roof and stuff um, so really cool buildings our biomedical engineering building was also built while I was there um, it downstairs had like a jump simulation center with like um, like a like a it had a like a, a virtual reality systems where you could like um, check out different parts of the body in VR. It had like a jump simulation center where they um, essentially was like a mock surgery room. So they'd have like these like $15,000 dummies of like people. And then you could like perform CPR on them or like um, try like intubation or other like cool procedures on them. Um, so like they had a lot of cool facilities um, at U of I. Um, they also have a hospital, um, Carl Hospital. And so a lot of research um, was done in partnership with them. Um, two of the labs that I worked in, in my undergrad, actually, their off like their, like, offices or like the place I researched was at the hospital. So, um, it, at the cancer center, we would like so I would take the bus to the cancer center, and my research was in that building, um, which was really cool. So a lot of, a lot of engineering also goes with the Carl Center, um, Carl Hospital system as well. Yeah. Yeah, those are some great reasons. Like, so I know that um, UIUC has, when you apply to UIUC, they ask you to write an essay about, you know, why this major in particular, and you have a lot, lot of great reasons. So do you have any piece of advice on how, you know, one can articulate those reasons in the essays? Because I know those have become quite popular, like the Y, the y X major, mm -hmm. you know. Um. So when you're, um, I feel like if I, I, I wish I had that kind of advice when I was applying, because I feel like I was kind of just going through everything without any um, guidance. Mm -hmm. But when you're, when you're trying to write an essay about like why you're interested in a certain major, I think the best way to approach it is to look at some of, your passions um, as you, there's like two ways to approach it. Like one's is to look at their passions as you're like growing up or like in high school. And like, it's like actions, not words, right? You wanna show that like, I like did the mini medical program at I think Edward had like a mini medical pro school or something, or I volunteered at like a senior, senior living facility, or I, um, I don't know, I like create this organization where I allow students to learn about different careers like open gears. Um, you wanna show um, you wanna show that you're you you wanna show that you've done stuff to show your passion um, for whatever you're going for. Like if you're going biomedical engineering, show that you've done things that 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 like you are interested in this major. You've done things like workplaces where work in places in the medical like industry or medical um, scene. Um, so that's one way to, to approach it is to show that you're passionate and show that your actions have shown your passion. Another way is to 
look at the kind of history or um, kind of like how a college has like their reputation and their history with certain things. Um, innovation is huge at U of I. Um, show that you've taken from certain innovators at U of I, whether it be like the co-founder of YouTube. Um, and just like say, talk about how like, how the different faculty or like alumni have been so successful and that like you have that same drive and passion. Um, or if you're talking about like the resources, be like, explain how you want to um uh how you how you know that u of i has committed to these like giving opportunities to students uh, or whatever college is giving committed to um giving opportunities to students and that you want to be the one taking care taking advantage of those opportunities and like being able to use them to their fullest um, so that's like some of the ways that you can like approach that yeah, I see. I see. Those are great. Those are great answers. Uh, I have a question here in the chat. What is something that you wish you knew in high school and would tell current students who want to do BME? Um, I think I wish I knew. That's tough. I feel like I feel like I. I'll get more into this later, but the best advice I have is just to explore different things, different passions, whatever you're interested in. Uh, if you're interested in biomedical engineering, um, talk to people that have gone through that, like like right now, like you're talking to a biomedical engineer um, or talk to like older people that are in the industry already. Um, what else you can like, a lot of, a lot of physicians and doctors um, are biomedical engineers or like did their degrees in biomedical engineers um just like call them up or like send them an email let's honestly reach out to people who have experience in in what you want to do and just like talk to them and ask them questions and just like learn as much as you can you just have to be like a sponge and absorb as much information as you can and that really helps in in learning about stuff like biomedical engineering or anything that you want to do honestly um, to my best advice would just be to reach out to people, um, talk to as many people as possible. You can never have a shortage of people whose insight you can get. So just like talk to people and just learn as much as you can. Yeah, I, I also agree. I think networking is one of the biggest things you can do. It's about developing those connections because through those connections that you develop, you can learn so much more. Mm -hmm. It's really important. It's whether you're just starting out or you're like, like have like 30 years experience, you can never do enough networking. Just need to talk to as many people and just learn as much as possible. Um, so here I'm talking, showing a little bit about my work and research that I did in my undergrad. Um, I worked in three different labs and was in a startup throughout my undergrad. Um, the MatMed lab was a therapeutic materials lab where I researched nanoparticles or point of care devices. Um, essentially, the idea here was that you could make nanoparticles that uh, would be able to and put them in like an array, like a sensor that could um, detect um, essentially like a saliva based test for um, like heart attacks or like other heart diseases. Essentially, Oftentimes, blood tests are the way that you learn about different disease, like you have certain diseases. Um, but the thing is, your saliva actually has a lot of biomarkers in them as well. Um, that can also be used to diagnose the same diseases, but in a much less invasive way. So the idea of point of care devices is that think about places that are more remote or rural. Um, here, you may not have access to large medical facilities or hospitals, right? So what if you had a small device where you just like take a little bit of saliva, um, have it go through this small like small like handheld device, and that will be able to tell you like, oh, you are at high risk for like heart disease or you have like an, like a really cool or interesting thing I found was that um, that up to 72 hours before someone gets a heart attack, there's 
certain biomarkers that their hearts, um, heart exhibits and that this can be found in the bloodstream. Um, so if you know someone's at a high risk, if they were to take this test and be like, oh, you may have a heart attack in like sometime in the next like week or so, like let's get you like, see like maybe give you care already, maybe find a way to like prevent it or like find like remedial measures already. Um, so that's kind of like the application of that research. Um, MTM Labs was actually a lab at University of Illinois at Chicago. And this is a, I'll, I'll give you a story about essentially how I um, uh, found this lab. Um, essentially over the summer, um, I wanted to find another research opportunity. Um, so I was just thinking, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do the same research I was already doing in my um, college. I kind of wanted to just like try something completely different. Um, so I emailed pretty much every biomedical engineering professor in the Chicago area, um, like Northwestern, Loyola, UIC, Illinois Tech, um, like literally everybody. And I was like, hey, would you be willing to take me on as like a undergrad, like summer researcher, summer intern or so? And honestly, a lot of people said no, or a lot of people just didn't respond, to be honest. But there were a few that responded. And here's like one of them, um, Professor Ketani was actually willing to take me in. And um, so then I got this to research. Um, it's a really cool thing. Uh, essentially what they do is they make tissue, um, tissue models, like liver, liver models um, for drug testing. And so how that works is that, um, so, you have, so you have a lot of drugs um, that, that you put into your body. Um, a lot of them are synthesized by the liver, um, whether it be toxins such as alcohol or actual like drugs that are used for um, therapeutic purposes, everything goes through the liver. So, so when you create a new drug, you want to see how does this drug affect the liver um, because it's going to go through there. However, it's really hard to use a whole liver or just hard to get livers for drug purposes, right? You can't just like find a liver and dedicate the whole liver to using a certain, like to like seeing the effect of this one drug out of this one concentration. So instead of what they did is they took hepatocytes, which are liver cells. Um, they seeded this on like a Petri dish with a certain substrate. Um, and essentially they would, if you like grow them for a few days, they would show um, liver-like phenotypes. Um, one big phenotype was the formation of bile ducts. So the liver has bile ducts, um, like a regular healthy liver has bile ducts. And if you take these um, hepatocytes, you, when you grow them in these small petri dish, even though it's only like a few hundred cells, after a few days, they will also show bile ducts, um, which is like really cool. They can make essentially a small scale model of the whole liver. And so instead of testing a drug on a whole liver, you just put it on the small scale model, see how it, how it reacts. And um, again, you can, you can test so many drugs on with very little actual like cell, cell, cellular material. Um, so that was the basic premise of that lab. And I only did that for a summer. Um, it was kind of like a summer internship kind of thing, but it was a really cool experience. Um, it was also a much smaller lab. Um, Matt, Matt, Matt Med Labs and GI Labs was very, very big labs um, with like a lot of PhD students, but, Matt, for the, but the MTM lab was really small. So it was also a, like a totally different experience in that regard as well. JI Labs was another lab that I was in. It was like an imaging and sensing lab. Um, so if you see, it's kind of un, unintentionally, I seem to have hit three of the four bioengineering tracks in my research. Um, but GI Labs was more of an imaging lab. And what I did is I used microscopy techniques to study um, cancer cell migration. Uh, so cancer cells will have different phenotypes um, and different like um, organizations of heterochromatin. And you can image this using like really these super high resolution microscopes. Um, and when I take high resolution, I mean like, this is like, it was like a 200 pound, um, essentially 200 pound like system on this like giant desk. And it's like full of different mirrors and prisms and like magnifying glasses and everything. And it just like essentially is able to, to, to take the, um, to like separate out different waves of the wavelengths of light to, um, to get like specific um, information data. Um, and I, we literally worked in this room that was cool to like 55 degrees because the, the microscopy system would get so hot that you couldn't put it into a regular room. 
Um, so even in like the middle of summer, I have to go to go to lab with a jacket on because it gets cold in there. Um, but so that was kind of like the work I did at JI Labs. Um, and finally, um, Phantom Core was a st student startup that I was part of. And here we um, were trying to develop low cost liver models for like, educational use, um, specifically for like practice surgeries. So the, the overlying idea for this was that, um, that medical like surgical um, errors are, are like a pretty relevant uh, problem in the medical field. Um, so the idea was that if you know that someone is in, is coming in for like some sort of liver surgery, um, what if you take like a, uh, like an MRI of that person's liver, um, 3D print it, and then make like a silicone based um, model, like fit liver phantom essentially of that liver. And what if you, the, what if the surgeon could practice on this liver before he tries it on like a real patient? Um, and essentially, this educational use would allow um, um, surgeons to be more comfortable with livers um, or like whatever organ that they want to use or operate on and uh, essentially decrease the like possibilities of surgical errors. Um, so that was what that was about. Um, I know that was a lot of information. Uh, so if anyone was in, had any questions about any of these experiences, I'm willing to answer any questions here. Yeah, that's a good, that's a lot of awesome research projects. So did you do research as, um, are there opportunities to do research as a freshman student in college? Yeah. Um, actually I didn't do research my freshman year cause I, I didn't know about research really. Mm -hmm. Um, so all these were in my, my three years after my freshman year. Um, the, the, honestly, it's actually easier to get started on research as a freshman because a professor knows that if you can get a, get a student as a freshman, you have them for four years for them to like get up their skills and like actually put in and like get a good project going. Um, so it's actually, it's actually encouraged. I would encourage you to look for research as a freshman. And how you do this is um, honestly, you can, you can uh, cold email professors or, um, or a better and perhaps bolder way of doing it would be just walk into them, walk into their office hours or like offices while they're in it, just talk to them, like strike up a conversation. Um, if you're, if you're one of them, one of them is your professor for a class, um, just after class, like, hey, I, I looked into your research. Um, I'd be interested in learning more. Um, just like show genuine interest in a topic. Um, and this goes especially for if you're cold emailing professors. Um, I, I would always, um, I would always like look at their lab website. Every every professor will have a lab website. Um, look at their lab website, um, see what the research they're doing. Look at some of their recent papers and publications. And let's see, um, are any, any of those, like sometimes they'll have like an ongoing project section. Um, read up on that and then email the professor. Hey, I saw that you're working on XYZ. Um, I think it's a really cool work. Uh, I'm interested in like working on this aspect of the project. I think I have some really cool ideas for this. Um, would you be willing to meet up, meet up sometime to like talk about the research and possibly joining the lab opportunities in the lab? Um, that's just a great way to show that you're not just, just sending like automated emails to professors because professors hate it when they just get random emails from people be like, Hey, I want to do research. Thanks. Bye. And then like, they don't care. They'll ignore it. They don't want, they have plenty of things on their plate already. And they want people that show genuine interest in what they're, what they're researching. Um, because if you can get as excited as they are about what they're doing, then they'll be more than willing to have you on board. Right. Yeah. Because anyone can say that, oh, I want to do research, but not everyone takes the time to, you know, fully um, invest their resources to actually understand what the science, what the professor is actually doing. And if you can take advantage of that, then you're more likely to get that spot. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's like, it's really annoying um, to do it. Just like you have to like read like high level publications. It might be kind of hard. You might not understand everything, um, but the fact that you put in the effort to learn or try to learn shows some of your character as like a researcher, right? So then the professor will definitely see like the merit in that when they're considering taking you in as a as a student. 
Um, and um, the reason I had so many experiences, generally a student would usually only work in one lab over, over, over the course of his undergrad. Um, it was actually my, the Matt Litmed lab actually, my professor moved to a different university in the middle of my, or at the end of my sophomore year, um, or the, like the midway through my junior year. Um, so I didn't have a lab for after, I worked in this lab for like a year and a half and then he moved away. So I was like, I had to find another lab. So then I joined JI Labs after that. And then MTM was what I did over the summer. Um, so that was just a little bit about um, why there's so many research experiences. Um, organizations are also a really big part of your um, undergrad. Um, you don't want to do too many because if you spread yourself too thin, you're not going to get much and much um, like accomplished in them. Um, I would say two, maybe three are probably as many organizations as you want to get involved in because um, otherwise you won't be able to put as much time into it. Um, I, I, the only organization I did consistently was Biomedical Engineering Society. And um, this is like a national organization, Biomedical BMES is a national organization, but they have university chapters, pretty much every university. And essentially what they do is they support the, the biomedical engineering community by providing mentoring, outreach, networking, and technical opportunities. Um, so I was involved throughout my whole undergrad with roles from photographer my freshman year to like technical director my senior year. Um, and just like a lot of different things. And it was just really cool because I learned so much. I met with so many people and I got also developed technical skills. It was great. Um, but regardless of what major you're doing, engineering or not, I would highly recommend joining any organization related to your major in undergrad, um, whether it be law or business or psychology, like any, almost every school will have a professional society for that. And that's just a great way to make connections and just learn more about that major. So some of the projects that I did, um, this was through our, um, through BMES, BMES, so Gate Analyzer, Beats by Dr. J, and In the Eye of the Beholder were all through BMES. Um, Surgical Simulator was my senior capstone project. So Gate Analyzer was where I used this connect system with uh, MATLAB code to measure stride length and skeletal data. Um, basically you just walk in front of the connect and it would be able to tell you how long your strides are and also map your skeleton on your body. Um, Beats by Dr. J was essentially, I used ARM EMG signals to control musical instruments and create unique tunes. This was a really cool project. Uh, also, we had a lot of problems right at the very end. So we ended up staying up the whole night to fix it, but it ended up being a really cool project. And honestly, one of my proudest achievements. Um, in the eye of the beholder, this was cut, cut short by COVID. Um, so we didn't actually get to present it, but we had, what we had done was we created this VR environment to simulate different types of color blindness. And finally, surgical simulator was this um, VR surgical, surgical simulation to model the human hand. Um, I saw the question, did you apply for scholarships in high school? Um, I applied to a few of the big ones. Um, like, I think, I think there's one called Jack Kent Cook. I think that was, that was a big scholarship. Um, I, I actually am not a permanent resident. Um, so when I was applying, I couldn't apply to a lot of like the local scholarships. A lot of local scholarships are required to be you to be like a citizen or permanent resident. Um, if you are, if you are, then I would highly recommend just applying to like local scholarships and you'll get even like really random ones. Like they'll have ones for like left-handed people or like people who like yo-yoing or something, it'll be like something random, but they'll give you $500 to go to college and like, Hey, why not? You know? Um, yeah. But um, so those scholarships are more like on your, like, like, kind of like on your end. Um, certain colleges will also give you certain scholarships as well. Um, um, they might give you like financial aid or a uh, certain amount of money if you like stick with a program for three years kind of deal. Um, so there's definitely opportunities and I would definitely look into them as well. Right. So these projects that you did, were they associated with your classes or were they outside for classes? So these three were outside of classes. This was through BMES and essentially, um, What's something really cool about U of I is that every year they have this 
huge event called Engineering Open House, which is um, best way to ex explain it is like a science fair for college students. And essentially, um, every engineering discipline will have their own society and their society will organize projects or like have people like apply for projects through them. And so, um, so these three projects were projects that I had uh, applied to do like, hey, I wanted to, and I essentially all I had was like an idea. I was like, I want to analyze gate using, I don't know what, probably like MATLAB or like connect. Um, and then Beats by Dr. J was also like, kind of just like, I want to make music using muscles. And then on the eye of the beholder was like creating VR or it was just like, I want to simulate colorblindness. Um, so it was like, you're, you're kind of applying or like going into it, not knowing much, but BMES um, sets you up with resources that you can use to get funding through the department and through the engineering council, which is like the overarching engineering, engineering organization at U of I. And um, essentially you get funding, you get resources, and then you can kind of just like explore and try to make a solution throughout the year. So I worked on these projects between like um, October um, and this was with like teams. We had like teams of like four to six. Um, October to about March uh, and, then, and then like present in like late March um, to like the public. So like students will come in from local schools, people in the community will come in and essentially we like presented to them and it's always great to see little kids and how they react um like beats by dr j was really cool because essentially we used emg signals so emgs are um is like electro myography and essentially that is like essentially your any muscle you have in your body is controlled by a small electrical impulse that is sent from your brain um so if you hook up these emgs to your arm and then you flex your arm uh you you, you can actually um, sense a, like a voltage difference, uh, like a voltage potential. And you can take this potential and essentially um, quantify it and make it into, and con like convert that to like musical sounds, depending on how strong that voltage is. Um, so actually I'll explain that in a later slide too. Um, uh, but this is a surgical simulator here. Basically, we coded all of this. I don't know if it's, the video is playing actually. Okay. Um, so basically, we coded this whole hand. Oh, the video is not playing really well. But essentially, we coded this whole hand in VR. Um, or this arm was essentially made in Blender. And then we moved it to VR. And you could like move it around, see the different parts of it, and like see it in like a such like a me medical like classroom setting. Um, it's really cool, like Scapson project. Um, that video is not working too well, unfortunately. So, but that's one of the, that was my Capson project. And Beats by Dr. J was essentially this like a overview of how it works. Um, take these electro signals, you put it into an amplifier circuit. Um, then the Arduino processes these signals and then the computer takes these signals and it can turn it into sheet music or like make sounds um, out of it. So like, depending on how hard you flex your arm, you can make a higher pitch sound or lower pitch sound like for like a piano. Um, so that was a really cool project that I had done. Um, do you guys have any questions regarding any of the projects or any of my research so far? Cause I'm gonna go on to the next step. Yeah, so it looks else. like a lot of what you're doing, like a lot of these projects involve a, like a lot of computer knowledge, like a lot of computer science and stuff. So is that something that you learn a lot as a biomedical engineering major, the computer science? Um, you, these are, a lot of these are done in teams. So you will, you may have someone who's more experienced in computer science, um, but there's definitely, you take like the introductory computer science, um, but a lot of computer science uh, like topics you can actually pick up pretty quickly based on what project you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, once you understand the basics of how like a certain program works or certain like code works, and you can always find repositories of code online and essentially like change it up. Once you know like the syntax well enough, change it up to fit whatever you want it to do. Mm -hmm. Um, for this project, it was actually, uh, we kind of split it up into different parts and there were, there were a few, there was a couple of ECE majors, majors who worked more on the, like the 
computer and CS part of, parts of it, um, while others work more on like making the amplifier circuit, which I had a lot of experience with, or um, working with the Arduino. Um, so CS is a CS is like I I kind of think of it as like a very useful thing to know. Um, it will be helpful for anything you do if you can model it or put it in like do a language um, or like model it or just like make some sort of visual representation. It's always a really cool tool to have in your toolkit. All right, for sure. Um, so future plans. Um, currently, I'm a PhD student and I enjoyed research in my undergrad um, and I essentially wanted to broaden my experience. So that's kind of why I um, wanted to do a PhD. Um, as for what I want to do after, I'm still exploring post PhD plans, uh, maybe do industry for a little bit and go to academia, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, so the big takeaway from this is that you have plenty of time. Um, I know applying to college, selecting a major can be really daunting, but like you can always switch it up whenever you want. And honestly, college is a big part of college is kind of finding yourself and what you want to do. Um, so don't be discouraged if you feel like you don't know what you're doing going into college. Yeah, quick question about um, PhDs. Did you have to uh, fill out like an application for the PhD? Yeah, um, PhD applications are pretty similar to undergrad applications. Uh -huh. uh, but I feel like an undergrad, depending on what college you apply to, they have very like creative questions, right? Um, if you've started looking at those essay prompts, they might have something, some really wacky questions. Um, but PhD, PhD essays are pretty straightforward. And they're basically like, why do you want to work? Why do you want to do a PhD here? What are your interests in? Like, what specific like, thing are you interested in? Um, stuff like that. So it's more straight to the point, I would say, um, than other than undergrad college apps. Um, some colleges would require the GRE, um, which is um, similar to the ACT or SAT. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like now less and less colleges require it. Um, so it's not as important as it used to be, but that's like another standard I standardized test just like the ACT or SAT. Uh -huh. I see, yeah, thank you. Um, finally, tips on how to learn more. So in high school, a lot of things you can do is like take challenging courses. I mentioned I took a bunch of courses, not, not always related to what I wanted to study. Um, but regardless, they will prepare you for college courses and teach you time management skills. Um, classes can also help you learn about your interests. Um, so even if you like, you never, you, you didn't plan on going into doing something with chemistry, if you took chemistry and you liked it, maybe that's something you want to try out in, in, in college. Um, another thing you do is extra, do extracurriculars, um, try out different clubs, whether it be academic or not academic. Uh, and and it's just a great way to explore your passions and just kind of learn what you want to do and what you like to do. Um, talk to older people, talk to college students, just like you're doing right now, and other older people with experience and different perspectives on stuff. Um, it's always interesting to see what um, what other people, well, you'd be surprised how much you would have in common with people much older than you that went through the same things that you did. Um, so any mentorship opportunities that you have, always take advantage of it. Um, you'd be surprised how much new stuff you would learn. Finally, work on projects, um, whether through your classes or outside of school projects allow you to understand goal setting and how to deal with challenges. If you're huge into coding, make some like small apps or like small programs that like do certain like small things. It, has to be, it doesn't have to be any life changing or huge, like huge goal or functionality just do a small project that kind of teaches you about certain language coding language or if you're big into art to do like artwork or graphic design um colleges and employers love to see that you're willing to do stuff outside of school without like a teacher or something else hovering over you to make sure you get to get it done right um so if, if it shows you that you have your self-motivation that you can drive yourself to like learn new things and do things without without having like any other external influence, that's pretty honorable, honestly. So if you can work on small projects outside of school, that's, that's, that's more power to you. And so general tips I would be saying is that don't be afraid to explore new clubs, classes, hobbies, opportunities. Um, 
a huge part of figuring out what you want to do is figuring out what you don't want to do. Um, so knowing, knowing what you don't like is as important as knowing what you like. Um, uh, I feel like when I was in high school, I had a, um, I, I enjoyed history, um, but I was like, I definitely don't want to do, do like history stuff. Um, just like, I don't like this, like so much like memorization and all that, um, like in my college years. So like maybe history is not for me um, or just like, just other things that like, maybe you're not huge into biology. So you realize maybe mechanical engineering or more math or science, math or like physics stuff is more for you. Um, so it's like, it's a lot about learning, figuring out what you like and don't like. Um, another thing is you connect with all different kinds of people and start making a network. Um, you'll never know who you'll meet and how they could help you later on. Um, stay up to date with your current events, your skills, your opportunities. Um, just like reading the news for like five minutes every day in the morning or reading like science magazine or like checking out a certain subreddit um, really will make sure that you stay up to date with what's going on. Um, another big one is, especially if you're in high school, is to make a resume and a LinkedIn and learn how to use them effectively. Um, if you kind of get into the groove of like, um, groove of like, uh, updating your resume often or updating your LinkedIn, make sure they match up and connecting with people using LinkedIn has so many um, opportunities like LinkedIn learning and like different um, organizations and groups for specific interests. And if you learn how to use that in high school already, you'll like hit the ground running when you get to, get to undergrad. And whether you, whether you, you do it in college or in workplace, like LinkedIn and like basic resume, um, resume and interpersonal skills are very important. So definitely put time and effort into that. Um, there's definitely one thing I wish I'd done earlier. Uh, I, I feel like I didn't learn how to use LinkedIn properly until like this year. And um, if you knew how to do that earlier, you just make connections so well. And it's really, really a really cool asset to have. And finally, have fun. Um, I feel like in high school, there's so much pressure trying to do all your classes, balance extracurriculars, all the different pressures um, that you may have. Um, and on top of that, you're trying to figure out what you wanna do with your life. And it can be pretty daunting, but honestly, try to find little silver linings in everything. Try to have fun with what you're doing. Um, it's a journey um, and that journey doesn't end when you apply to college. Um, you spend your whole life learning about new things. Um, and honestly, it's never too late to, to follow something you love. So like, just have fun in that process. Don't feel like it's like a chore. Just kind of like try to find fun in that. Um, so that's all I have. Um, thank you guys for listening and connect with me on LinkedIn. I can scan the QR code if you want. Um, but other than that, I have, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I also have my email. I forgot to put my email. Um, I'll put that in the chat. Yeah, if you could put that in chat, that'd be great. But again, thank you so much. I think you covered up my golden question with those last two slides, you know, about what biggest piece of advice you'd give to high school students. And then that aspect of networking and, you know, taking advantage of, you know, people around you to gain as much insight as possible is so relevant and it's such an important piece of tip, piece of advice, which is, you know, highly influential. And, you know, through this presentation, like I didn't realize how complex biomedical engineering can be. Like there's so many different tracks that you can specialize in that integrate a lot of the engineering, a lot of the different engineering disciplines, like computer engineering, some electrical engineering, some computer science, and, you know, all those projects that you've did over the course of the past couple of years really exemplify that blend that biomedical engineering offers. And, and it was really interesting to hear about all of your experiences and biomedical engineering in general. So, you know, thank you so much for sharing. And um, if everyone could please give a virtual round of applause to Jayraj, that would be awesome. And again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to, um, Share them right now. 
Yeah, I know it covered a lot of material. So like if there's if you have any anything at all you want to learn more about, I'm willing to go over it. Okay, so if no one has any more questions, you know, again, feel free to contact Jayraj with the um, email that he provided in the chat. Um, you can also connect with him on LinkedIn with the QR code. But again, thank you so much, Jayraj. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share more about biomedical engineering. And it was a really informative presentation.